Um, welcome to this morning instructional strategies. And uh, really pleased um, to have coffee, tea, and food, and the that been able to grab something. Please sneak out after I finish talking and and get something. Um, it's really a pleasure to to be here. I want to acknowledge um, Yasmin Sidat Khan, who is really the, the mastermind behind pulling this together, with a lot of support from Eileen and Janet and Brad. Um, just a nice <laughs> And before we get started, I want to get just a sense of who we have here today. So if you primarily focus on mathematics, early grade, pre-primary, upper grade, research or implementation, but mostly mathematics, could you raise your hands? If you mostly primarily focus on reading, could you raise your hands? And if you focus on both? Great, okay, a very nice balance. <laughs> um, so thank you. So this is really an opportune moment to be having this discussion about math. Um, Rebecca Rhodes, um, who I also want to acknowledge. She'll be the moderator of this feedback sessions on the U.S. government strategy for international development assistance. Um, and for those of you who have read it or the READ Act, which kind of spawned this USG strategy, mathematics plays a really sensible role. Um, and it's it's very timely that, that, that mathematics is getting this amplified focus. Um, often we, we try to put math and reading together, we implement, and there's a lot of interest in looking at the correspondences between the two, but we really can't fully understand how to implement math with reading until we get a really good grasp of what it takes to implement quality uh, instructional practices for math specifically. It's also a great need to have this discussion. Um, whereas in reading, there's a growing body of research from international uh, contexts on what it takes to effectively to build um, literacy development. For math, most of the research is still coming from the U.S., from European contexts, and from East Asia. So there's not the same body of evidence that can be drawn upon specifically from um, the broader international global sphere. So the, the intent of this forum this morning is really to start having that dialogue and to articulate the beginnings of a research strategy, a research um, as we move forward, how we can begin to fill some of those gaps. Um, so a little bit about the format. Um, and then I'll introduce the panelists and move right into it. Um, important thing about the format is we do have Wi-Fi in the room. <laughs> Those who, who need it um, have at least one uh, uh, placard here. There's going to be a series of panel presentations, relatively brief each, after which there'll be a broad Q&A uh, discussion period. <coughs> For those of you who focus primarily on reading, there are going to be some explicit comparisons made between that. So really come from your own perspective with your own lens and think about what this means to you and what you can bring to the dialogue, looking specifically at the kinds of questions that are posted around the room, guiding some of the discussion later. Any questions? Yasmin, have I missed anything? All right. Um, so then I'll introduce our panelists. Sorry, Janae. I just wanted to flag that there is sound problems on um, the call, and we're only seeing the audience. It would be great if we could see the speaker. Um, the senior research scientist at the African Population and Health Research Center, otherwise known as APHRC. We have Norma Evans, who is um, technical director of Evans and Associates Educational Consulting Limited. Um, we have Shireen Luchfeli, who um, is advisor, basic education, I'm sorry, basic literacy and numeracy at Save the Children. And then we have Yasmin, 
who is a senior early education, early childhood education researcher and advisor at RTIRL. So thank you again, all of you. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to enjoy and learn myself. Good morning, everyone. We're just going to try to switch the presentation very quickly. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Yasmin Sitab Khan, and um, I am at RTI International, and we are really excited that all of you guys are here to talk about math and to start thinking a little bit more about um, mathematics instruction. And we really wanted to focus our panel today on classroom instruction. So what's actually happening in the classroom? What are teachers doing? How are students responding? That's what's going to be a focus. So I've heard there might be some math anxiety <laughs> already because it's just a math event. So the best way to deal with that, we thought, is to start off with a math problem. So we're going to start with a math problem. No, no anxiety <laughs> levels. Uh, okay, so we're, what we're going to start off with is uh, a problem which is classified as an MKT problem, Mathematical Knowledge for Teaching. So this would be a problem that you want teachers to know how to solve to be able to teach mathematics. So this is just a quick one that you guys can do. You don't have to work alone. You can work with someone else. But solving, solve this problem, one half divided by one fourth. So I see a lot of answers. See good strategies, holding up fingers. <laughs> Does anyone have, does anyone want to share very quickly how they solve the problem? You had your hand up first. Okay, so you took the inverse of uh, one, one quarter. Did one half times four. Right. Invert and multiply. How many people use that strategy? But it's not a fraction of. Yeah, yeah, there's different ways. You know, one thing, especially people that were educated in a certain way, invert and multiply is a very common way, fraction divided by fraction, right? A lot of people use it. So now, let's pretend you are a teacher, okay? You're teaching this maybe fourth grade, fifth grade, around there. How would you represent this visually? So what is something you could draw? help students understand this concept. Your concept is a fraction divided by a fraction, okay? We all know invert and multiply. That's a procedure. How would you figure out what's something you could draw that would help children understand this? So just take like two minutes in your, at your tables. You can work alone. You can work with someone else and try to draw something that might represent it. All right. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs> 
trying to figure out the solution. Did anyone get one that they, they really like, that they want to just very quickly come and share? <laughs> but mine is not the cutting the student. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, can I drive somewhere? Sure. Uh, a big pen? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> well, hi, my name is Cheryl Ernest. I'm a, um, I work in early grades mathematics, so. Has a little I, bit. I'm cheating a little bit. <laughs> um, so I thought of it like an area model. So if this is your hole, you can divide it. There's half over here. And then the question you can turn into something like um, how many fourths fit into that one half? So I can see here that two fourths fit into the one half. And that's why oh, okay. <laughs> I, I saw a lot of different people using area models. If you used an area model like that or a circle, put your hands. Okay, lots of people use area. Did anyone use a linear model, like a number line, or we've used race courses before, or something like that? Actually, it's not raise the denominator. Raise denominator one, you know, one fourth of a person, multiply that by four, and then you know, multiply that half by four, and then you end up with one person getting two. Okay. You could do that. But yeah. that's, not, that's not, I don't know how to graph this, either on a, on a number slide yeah. or on anything else. Yeah, and if you're, you know, again, you're thinking if this is the introduction of a concept for children, what you're really trying to get them to understand is that a fraction divided by a fraction, what you're looking at is, some, is trying to understand you want to know how many times does one fourth fit into one half, right? That's kind of what your question is. That's what you're trying to get students to understand. So again, the purpose we're, we don't the purpose of doing this was really to say there's a couple different reasons. But first is you know representations. What you choose to draw and show to students matters, right? If you draw something, depending on what you choose to draw, it's really going to convey an idea to students or not convey an idea. So that what you choose is very important. Um, the other two, you know, big points we just wanted to talk about are um, it's, it's really not enough to just know how to solve the problem. You're a teacher, right? All of you can solve the problem very quickly, right? But what we really want teachers to, what we want to move teachers towards is understanding why, right? Understanding the concept underneath it and how to convey that to students in a way that that works, right, that students will understand. Um, and then one just really quick last point. What we did today, if you guys notice, it really, we spent very little time on the answer, right? We spent most of our time on the process. And again, that's something we want to model and do for students is mathematics, we really are talking about the process of solving a problem, not just getting the right answer. And I know oftentimes traditional math classrooms are really about getting the right answer. Not that it's not important, but we really want to talk about the process. So I'm going to move us to, these are some guiding questions that are actually posted around the room. Thank you. Um, uh, these are just some questions for everyone to think, keep in mind as we are presenting, right? So. We have, like, how is the mathematics instruction that we discussed today different from the mathematics maybe you experienced growing up or still experience, or maybe the teachers that you experience, that you work with? Um, and how do we think about 
these research-based strategies that we will talk about today and contextualizing them. Uh, what do you think the main challenges are in early grade mathematics instruction? There's one way at the back in orange. What similarities and differences do you see between effective instruction in the early years in literacy and mathematics? Uh, how do we convince stakeholders that early mathematics is important in and of itself? And as mathematics becomes more of a focus, what do you see as some of the key pedagogical practices that we should prioritize? So we're going to hear a lot of different perspectives, different panelists. Uh, we have some post-it notes, so if you think of any thoughts about these different questions or have any anything you want to share, feel free to jot it down on a post-it and just stick it on the, the chart paper for our discussion. So I'm going to hand it over. We're going to start with our panels. Another activity. I'll hand it over to you. Um, welcome again. Uh, my name is Linda Platas, and I'm going to be talking about actually a, a paper that Yasmin and I worked on, uh, Promising Instructional Strategies from Low and Middle Income. A couple copies out in the lobby or the, the area outside the door. Uh, and then it's also downloadable. Uh, so, uh, because this is an overview, because if I did the entire paper, we'd be up here a long time and we'd be bored by the time I got done. Uh, you can see all of the references and more information on in the document itself. So the outline, I'll talk a little bit about the purpose of it, uh, promising strategies, and then evidence from low and middle income context, and then recommendations. I think I'm supposed to stand under this thing. Okay, good. If I walk away, just everybody like motion for me to get back to the middle. Uh, so the purpose, there's a large body of research, mostly coming from the global north, coming from, uh, as was said before, uh, the U.S., Canada, Australia, uh, Western Europe, uh, East Asia, about the importance of mathematics. That's where a lot of our research comes from. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research that has been coming out of low and middle income countries. But what happens is that when we design interventions, we're relying on a very select group of, of research, right? Uh, and so the purpose of uh, the paper that we wrote was to actually look and see what there was out there in low and income, uh, low, in, low and middle income countries as far as research was. Uh, initially, what we did was we looked across all of the research that was out there, and we wanted to see what practices, uh, classroom practices, showed up as being effective, right? And so we did uh, this very broad uh, look at the research and found five promising practices that seem to be supported across the globe. Um, but in our review, we only found evidence for four of these when we looked at low and middle income. So we'll be going over there. So the first one is using multiple representations, including manipulatives. So this is instruction that addresses knowledge of both concrete, like something that you have in your hands or a drawing that you see, uh, and abstract levels. Uh, uses concrete objects using locally made objects. This is actually a picture of um, uh, students who are using locally made objects. And provides exposure to a variety of um, representations with examining ideas and concepts. So that's kind of what we were getting at when we had you draw an explanation of how to talk about one half divided by one fourth. We were trying to draw out different representations because there's not just one that works. So she said, there's a race course that you can use. People have used ribbon. Um, yesterday when we were talking about this, we were talking about cooking recipes. That seemed to be, I like cheese, and it seemed to kind of go really well, and it was around lunchtime. Um, so, but drawing on as many representations so that students can get an understanding, because they're not all going to understand one representation. Uh, and uh, here's an example of representation. So this is the numeral four, which represents the quantity of four. So there's a 10 frame where there's four counters in there. You could also use a number line that goes up to four, or you could have four bottle caps. So these are all different representations of the quantity of four. Uh, another one of the practices that we saw a lot of evidence for was knowing and using developmental progression. So these are sequenced. They build on prior knowledge of the child. 
Uh, they're differentiated, so not every child in the classroom is at the same level. So trying to figure out where children are, uh, especially if you have a classroom of maybe 100. Um, you probably won't know where everybody is, but you should get an idea of kind of where the majority of students are and then where some are that might be ahead um, or have less knowledge than others. Uh, and provides appropriately challenging tasks, right? You want children to be challenged and not bored in classrooms. Uh, and then also uses both conceptual and procedural knowledge because you're going to need both as you advance in mathematics. As an example of this, um, we have count all. So when children first learn to count, to add two sets together, they frequently will start at one set. If you have a set of three, start counting one, two, three. The other set has two, four, five, right? So you get five. That's a typical early way of counting. Pretty soon though, especially if they can visualize how many the first set has, they'll start doing something called counting on. So they'll start at three and then count to four and five. It saves time. Ultimately, they'll have in their head number families, right? So they'll know that one and four make five, two and three make five. And so that sort of, they'll, they'll just know that those two quantities will make five. Um, a caveat here is that these are not lockstep. So one of the things that happens, people say that children learn addition and subtraction before they learn division. I would argue that children who have siblings <laughs> learn division faster than anything else, right? And they learn it at like age two. He has more. I know he has more, and so it's not fair. Um, so this is not lockstep, but there are some general principles about how children learn, generally apply. Uh, supporting student explanation and justification. So what we were doing here, asking you to give us feedback about what the answer was or how you thought about it, that helps everyone understand better, and it helps you understand better. Sure, all of you. Yeah, all of you have bounced ideas off of colleagues. You learn a lot by just saying something out loud and talking to somebody else, right? So that's sort of what this is about. Um, and it uh, encourages, in the process, encourages teachers to ask why, how come, how did you get that answer, can you show me? Uh, and all of those get uh, children to think about the process of mathematics. Uh, connecting formal and informal mathematics. So this is a street vendor. Uh, in India, and they're selling lemons. And lots of lemons. Um, thank you. Yes, we need um, And so they've learned a lot outside of school, right? They can do some multiplication. Uh, they can do some division uh, because it means a lot, right? Because this is their livelihood. Being able to draw that knowledge into the classroom and make use of it is super helpful, right? Because then they connect it to something that really is meaningful to them. And they can also use it as they start integrating the math that they learn in school. So integrating formal and informal um, is very useful, a useful tool for teachers to have. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we conducted the gathering of articles. So. Uh, or the research, and so our initial search was from 1993 to 2018, long period of time. Uh, we went through EBSCO and Google Scholar using a combination of terms, math, mass, classroom instruction, um, teaching, uh, and the records that we identified was 1,406. So that means that we've got Excel sheets with a lot of articles in them. Uh, but we felt that that wasn't enough uh, well, no, we thought it was plenty, but, but that we hadn't drawn on enough resources. And so what we did was we talked to folks who had been doing research out in the field, and we said, you know, unpublished documents or reports that are up on the Internet, um, we just wanted to draw on it as many resources as we could. Uh, we also uh, looked at uh, reference lists um, from these articles and pulled those in as well. A lot of them cross-reference, but, uh, and so that identified additional 78. That was a total of 1,484, again, a very full Excel workbook. Um, then what we wanted to do was we wanted to narrow these down. So all of these had something about classroom instruction, but not all of them were really studies. Some were just talking about something that people did in the classroom, but they weren't necessarily research. And so the criteria that we decided for the final review was that it needed to cover pre-K through third grade. Uh, it also had to either be quasi-experimental or RCT because we wanted to have some sort of results to look at. So if we're trying to find promising practices, you need to have results to look at. And then finally, it had to actually include the instructional strategies. Um, so sometimes people say, well, we did this intervention, it was a package, and there you go. There was actually a lot of, there you go, this was a package. 
Uh, so we needed the inclusion of instructional um, strategies. Believe it or not, that narrowed it down to only 24. So after reviewing all of these articles, only 24 met all of those criteria. Uh, and so 1,460 were eliminated. Uh, then those 24 were coded for instructional strategies. So those strategies that I mentioned earlier, so developmental progressions, uh, multiple re representations, and informal and formal, and explanation and justification, um, they were all coded for those, and they were double coded. And then if there was a disagreement, um, there was a conversation about which of them it, it should include. And now it's yes, Mr. Oh, thank you, Linda. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is the studies, the 24 that we identified and what we saw, different patterns in them. So here is a very small table that is very hard to see. I don't think anyone can see it, but hopefully there's a printout of it so you might be able to see it in your paper. Yes. And there's also here you have this table also. So, you should have it. so this lists all the um, studies we found. If, and I just want to say, if anyone knows of any that we left out, please let us know. I'm sure there are some that we did not get to or we didn't just didn't show up in our searches. So feel free to have our emails to send it to us. Uh, this is what we found. These are the countries that we um, found the complete list of also the, the citations that can be found in the paper. So look up any of the studies, they're all there. And then this is the coding. So you get a you get a clear sense here that you know the there's a lot that have multiple representation, right? And it, as you move towards formal and informal, much less. So I'm just going to go through some of our results. So looking at the multiple representations, so 16 out of the 24 studies that we found had some sort of mention of multiple representations, including manipulatives. Um, actually, for I think all of them were only about manipulatives. So it would say something like, hands-on materials, locally sourced materials, um, you know, those types of words, active learning with games and materials, things, they were kind of code words that we looked for. Um, there was, you know, not to say that people didn't include multiple representations, but other, other than manipulatives, but they didn't put it in their reports. So we weren't able to find that. Uh, there was, you know, very little description though of how they were used. So it would say, we use local materials, but that's it, right? So there was no description of how they were used, why they were used, were teachers trained on their use, were they integrated into materials? There was very little um, talk about that. And I can't use that. Um, one example where there was actually a good description was, this is a study with Madeline Hadley, Parker, and Hernandez Agramonte. This is from, um, this is IADB, and they did an RCT in Paraguay with preschool children. And they actually did have some descriptions of games that they used and the types of manipulatives they used in the games, like balls and sticks to play a certain game, and they described the game. Uh, developmental progressions. This was the next most common one seen. There was 10 out of 24 studies. And most of what we saw here was the um, Sequence, so some sort of reference to materials to sequencing of content. Um, sometimes there were a few sets of reports or published studies that gave the materials. So ha actually had sample pages of like a week's worth of lessons or some four or five days of lessons. And those were actually very helpful to be able to see sequencing of content. Um, and the other way to see it was differentiated instruction. So any type of reference to focusing on one study or focus on one group of children, things like that. And an example we have is a Banerjee study in India in 2007 where it was an RCT intervention where they were looking at grades three and four students and it was a remedial learning project. So they grouped students that needed remedial learning and provided them with a separate type of instruction. Uh, supporting explanation and justification, only six out of 24 studies. So we did not see this very often. Obviously, there's, I mean, we don't really know why. There's two reasons. One is maybe they just didn't say that they did it. Maybe they did and it was not in the report. <laughs> I see some, yeah, maybe. Or the other thing is that this is probably one of the strategies that's very hard to implement, right? It's very hard to get teachers to explain, have students explain and justify. So that could be one reason. We do have one example from um, 
Kosovo, um, Bula et al., who they did an experimental study looking at metacognitive strategies and problem solving with, I think, grades three and five students. Last one, connecting formal and informal. Again, very not, not seen very frequently, last, only five out of 24 studies. And again, this could be same reason. They either didn't say they were doing it or it's very hard to do, right? It's hard to do effectively and really focus on. Um, one example we do have is a McEwen study from a long time ago, 1998, uh, which was with the Escuela Nueva movement in Colombia and RCT, where they really, the focus was on connecting real life to the mathematics done in school. So uh, these are just oops. <laughs> the next steps is gone. I should say next steps on this. These were our next steps. And as you can tell from what I was saying, a big part of doing this review was to help inform us about what we don't know, right? We there are all these studies. They have most of them, almost all of them have results of some kind, but there's very little description of what they're actually doing. And without that description, it's really hard as the field to learn to learn what to do, right? Because we can't really learn from other people because you, you don't know what they're doing. So um, our recommendations are, you know, we need more we need more detailed and specific instruction like um, details on what the instructional practice looks like in the classroom, right? So that that will help us as a field to kind of gather more evidence. We also need more studies that isolate the strategies. So like the, the Bula study in Kosovo, which was just focused on problem solving. That was a study that's an example where you're really just trying to see how do you get teachers to do problem solving? You're not trying to do everything, you're just looking at that one element. Um, again, methodology, we need to broaden it. So have more mixed methods, varied methods. And I think a big one here is looking at teacher practices as, as an outcome. If we wanna know how teachers are instructing better, measuring outcomes in terms of what teachers are doing, practices. And again, improve, this is a big one, transparency and dissemination. So really just making sure that what we're doing, where we're doing it is shared and everyone can kind of see and learn from what we're doing. That's it. I get the fun part. I actually get to play with you around mathematics. Um, so uh, you are going to have to work in groups of three. And I see some people at the back who are sort of spread apart. So I'm going to have to get, get a little closer. Uh, your neighbors. So um, I'm going to be. Instructional model for early grade mathematics, um, and it's going to. I'm going to ask you to connect back, and as you're as you're experiencing some mathematics, think back to some of the the, the big themes that came out of Linda and Yasmin's presentation about some really powerful math instructional strategies. All right, so all right, we're going to give it a try. You are going to be our class a very well behaved because you've been with me now for six months <laughs> very well behaved grade two and as you remember we've been working with big numbers numbers up to a hundred and a little beyond and we've been adding numbers and we've been using our base 10 blocks our bundles of tens and our ones to add numbers uh, so today we are going to go back to adding numbers and I want you to in your groups of three, I want you to add the numbers 99 and 64. But you cannot use a pencil, you cannot use paper, you cannot use your bundles of 10 or sticks. But I want you in your group of three to figure out how you might add that, those two numbers and see how many different ways you can come up with. But you remember, we always have to be prepared to share and to explain our strategy. 
So as a group, I want you to add and be prepared to share. And I'm going to go around, I'm going to listen to your thinking. So go ahead, I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. <laughs> strategies your group came up with for adding. One, three, two, four, four, three. Wow. All right. Does someone want to stand up and share, come up and explain to us, and you have papers all around, so you can use papers if you want to explain, how you went about adding mentally 99 and 60. I have a volunteer. Yes. I just um, paid 100, and because I made 100, I know I was going to take one away from 60. Uh -huh. So you made, a, how did you make 100? By taking, adding one to 99 to make 100. Remember it. How would we label it? Do you have a name for your strategy? Smart one. Smart one. Tens and six tens. Uh, how many tens we have? 
then adding up the units, so nine units and four units, and then we knew that we would get a 10 and some four units left over. What would we call Perry's strategy? Do you have a name for your strategy? Harder. Adding all the tens. Okay, so smart. Smart two. Okay, adding tens and ones. We're going to call Perry's strategy. Now, that was two strategies. Do we have a third one? Now we have to four. Yes. Okay, can you do that a little bit slower? <laughs> And then tens. We pick nine and four as ones. We added them together. Okay. And then we pick nine and six as tens. This is the way the 60 and the, the, the guys approach, the, the, the group behind us had a similar approach. So we look value based. We're looking at the ones, put them together, and then the tens, then put them together, and then bring the two together now. Ah, okay. So you put the tens together, the 90 yes. and the 60. Yes, and, and then, then you put the ones together, ones the together, nine and the four. Then add them together later. Okay. So you rearrange them. Okay, what do you call your strategy? Value based. Value based. <laughs> <laughs> this is, the, this is the advanced group. <laughs> <laughs> you always get interesting strategies from this group. All right. Um, okay. So we may agree. So we've got a lot of different strategies here. And so normally we're going to go fast here. I would model each one. And then we would figure out the label and we try them out. So now we've had a lot of different strategies and I've modeled it for you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you now that you can use any of these strategies you want. You can write these down in your notebook. But you actually don't have to do that here. <laughs> but again, you're going to have to be prepared. So you're going to do this one individually. And then I'm going to go around and you're going to explain what strategy you used. Um, and I'm going to check to make sure you're using an appropriate strategy. Okay. So we're going to stop here as if our class was over. Um, think back to some of the ideas that Yasmin and Linda were putting out there. Was there anything of the strategies that they mentioned evident in this little mini lesson that we did? Okay, which ones? That was a bad question. <laughs> that was a bad question. <laughs> the multiple representations would be the very first thing in the paper. Okay. And we did multiple representations. And if we had more time, we would have different drawings and different tens and ones to show it. But this is uh, we did a representation. The development and, progression. Okay, why was it the development progression? Because we're showing children first always learn from the ones before yes. they learn the, the tens. Okay. So linking that when they master this, then you go to the next one. That's more, more developmental. Okay. And I had mentioned that we had been doing addition with our base 10 blocks, our bundles of 10s and our 1s. And we were now moving from that to trying to represent it and, and, and reason it out in our heads. Okay, So there was a developmental progression, even if I just quickly went over it. Anything else that you saw that was evident? Uh, the justification practice for students. Got this answer. My process. Okay. That yes, having to explain, I got the answer this way and explain my strategy, and having other people listen to it and react to that strategy and labeling that strategy. Anything else that you?
make all of this really, really easy for teachers. It's really, really complex, multiple representations, just one. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a five-step math instructional model, which unfortunately I did not invent. I arrived in Egypt last year, and Yasmin had been there two years earlier and had done some math work, and I discovered her five-step instructional model. And it seemed to be to capture in a really easy to understand way the important things about learning. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is the five-step instructional model. The first one is, as a teacher, I choose. I need to choose the problem or the activity that I want you to do today because I know what it is I want you to learn. So the I choose becomes really, really important. Okay. The second step is you do. I want you to solve that problem. I want you to solve it in a group. I want you to figure out how to solve it. Use your representation. Use your manipulatives, use your drawings, use whatever you want, but I want you with your group to solve it and to be able to explain to us how you did it. So the third step is you explain to me. So you tell me how you solved it and I'm going to listen to your thinking and I'm going to choose people to explain. Now I couldn't do it here because there was so much noise in the room that I actually couldn't hear any of your strategies as I went around. But normally as a teacher I would listen. And I would choose those people who have an interesting strategy, a different strategy, but I would also choose those who misunderstood. I want to hear their thinking, and I want to be able to correct their thinking. So step number three is you explain to me so I get a chance to listen, and if necessary, I get to correct. Step number four is where I do. And then I'm going to take your thinking, and I'm going to model the strategy for you, or the strategies, because here we had four, which I wasn't expecting but four different strategies. And I'm going to model it so that we all understand. And then the last step is you do. What you do again, you're going to do it individually. So I'm going to give you a problem that is similar to the one you just solved to see whether or not you can apply it. Um, so when we compare it to the I do, we do, you do, which every Egyptian teacher knows by heart and loves, and our, our um, challenge in Egypt was trying to get them to understand mathematics and how that might be different. Because for the first time, Arabic specialists were going to teach mathematics. And the fear was, if we just apply I do, we do, you do, which they love to mathematics, we're not going to get the mathematics learning that the, the ministry wanted. So we did the relationship. So I do actually appears. But we're in literacy, I do appears first. I do appears first. Um, there is a we do, but the we do it is part of the you do when you're working it together, but also when you're explaining it. And the you do appears twice. It appears when you try and solve the problem at the beginning, but you do again individually when we actually apply it. Okay? So where we have a three-step model for uh, effective instruction and literacy, we have a five-step model. So there's some similarities, but some important differences. And the differences capture the essence of the type of mathematics learning that we want to see in the class. Okay. Sorry. Sure. This is the assumption that I choose. I choose is a really important one. Yes. Then what, what is the assumption here? That the children have some understanding of that particular problem? Um, if, if I'm a classroom teacher, I know what you've been working on, and I know where I want to take you next. And I choose a problem that will get you to where I want you to go next. And that's linked to that developmental progression and the type of understandings that you're ready to build now. So the most important step in all of this is actually the first one, the I choose, choosing the right problem. Okay, so some of the benefits of the five-step model when I discovered it. Um, it starts with problem solving. What do you really want to see in mathematics? The I choose. In the you do, the second one, we ask them to use anything they want to solve the problem and to explain their thinking. It integrates the multiple representations. Um, it naturally integrates mathematical communication. Justify your, your thinking. Explain your reasoning to the class and letting the others um, react to that. Um, there's also, the, as a teacher, there's the listening and the correcting of mathematical misunderstandings. Because I'm going to choose those groups that also have misunderstood, 
and I'm going to be able to correct some misunderstandings. There's direct instruction. I model. After we've had a chance to put all our thinking on the table, I'm going to summarize it, I'm going to model it for you and package it really nicely for you. And then there's independent practice, which is really important in that. You get to do it, you need to do it again. And some thoughts. Well, there is a lot of research on love solving problems. So the question, what I see here, and I'd love to see where you got this from, is I'm afraid this is from the Global Learn, where students are automatic calculators, teachers are automatic calculators. None of this happens. There's a whole issue of instructional time. So if you let students talk for however much, and you actually expect to have sufficient time to do this, I worry that it's come from Japan. I would instead say, instead I do, as here is one or two solved problems, then you can go on to this. Where the bell or the whatever at the end does not leave the students without them. But there is the big issue that I would like to see more and hopefully you will cover more. What are the bases of the math neuroscience that brings us to these estimations? How do we, what does it take to do mental math in order to do this? So I kind of get the sense that we're caught in the middle here. As I write thoughts. People can write thoughts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think I think if uh, when we're when we're building uh, university programs for teachers, we have to make that easy for them. Yeah, I choose what are the powerful problems that will that will build the understandings that we want to see. Yes. Of the model um, yeah. where the students practice, to what extent does it matter in the classroom where you have a teacher and other students? Or does it matter? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes? Um, so fascinating and largest <laughs> uh, presentation there. Um, how? I, would this, has this been tried out? Uh, did you try it out in Egypt in something like geometry or measurement or something that was yes. not calculation? Yes. Yes, we did. Because we were building um, a national in-service program for teachers, and we had to show how it applied to every single discipline. So yes, we had model lessons, multiple model lessons for each discipline. And we showed how you could do it with just using the textbook. If you just picked early primary math textbook. How, do you, how can you pick anything in that textbook and turn it into a five-step lesson? That was important. <coughs> I'm going to answer your question before I forget it. Um, I think it's really important that it actually be done in the classroom. Because if it's done in the classroom, the independent practice, then I go around and, and I can watch and I can interact and I can correct misunderstandings. So I think it's an essential part of the classroom, that independent time in the classroom. What about the link with the previous thinking, the previous knowledge? Or learning. Yes. Uh, that's why I'm asking about that. I choose assumption. Yeah, that's right. So how does that? How does a teacher once introduce maybe a bit of additional with carry, but the children have learned only simple addition. Yeah. So how does the link automatically come in in a, in a, in a, in a formal practice? Yeah. That the the I choose has to come at the right time. I have to choose the right problem for the developmental thinking as to where you are in your thinking. So this one, I know that you're able to add two-digit numbers. Um, with your base 10 blocks and that you can do a two-digit addition. Here what I want you to do is to play around with the relationship between numbers and how you might add those differently based on what you know about the relationship between them. So your assumption that you, the children will try, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have problem with the problem, so that would give you, that, that, that makes the next step easier. They, uh -huh. You give them that new concept, maybe they don't do it, then it makes it easier now for you to do it later as a model for them. If I'm introducing, for example, multiplication or something like a subtraction to a class which has never done before, I'm using the previous knowledge, then it means I should give, I should give them as a, as a concept. They don't do it. Maybe then it gives them now a chance to model for them later. Yeah. That's what yeah. that's kind of thinking. Maybe we take Oh, wow, we've got four. Can, can we save those till the end? Okay. Because yeah, we so will have good. another question and answer session. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn this over to. Yeah. 
Okay, I think we were going to take maybe like a short 10 minute break between the, before the next two. That's okay, so if everyone wants to stretch, get some coffee, tea, use the restroom, take a break. <laughs> 10 minutes. So thank you. It was actually very easy to bring people back from break, so I appreciate your uh, attentiveness. Um, we're gonna just move along with the next two of the of the presentations. Uh, my name is Shireen Lee. I'm with Save the Children, and I'll be talking to you about our early grades math uh, initiative that we call. Um, so I'll provide a little bit of an overview of numeracy groups, the background, the approach and methodology, and then move into talking about probably some very familiar sounding things from what Norma and Linda have been talking about uh, around the types of instructional strategies or approaches in the numeracy that we're working in. And then I'll leave you with um, some videos of what those strategies, activities look like in actual classrooms in um, Bangladesh and Malawi. So what is Numerous Cebu? Save the Children um, started working on math back in 2009. And it was um, through some of the work that we were doing in literacy on our literacy interventions that some of you might have heard about uh, called Literacy Boost. And so we were in Malawi and Nepal, and as part of the literacy intervention, we did a student assessment um, to see what the impact was on children from start of program to end of program. And in addition to a literacy assessment, we added some math questions age with math skills that children were like. And um, we found that not only did the literacy skills improve at the end of the intervention, but the math skills went up as well. And this was um, only through literacy support for teachers. There was no math training or content that we had delivered. So it made us think what would happen if we actually created a standalone math uh, intervention, and thus numeracy boost came about. Um, it is focusing on the foundational math concepts across these three domains. Um, so it's targeting children in grades K1 and 2 and 3. Um, so within number and operations, it's concepts like counting, one-to-one -one correspondence, basic addition and subtraction, basic multiplication and division, uh, geometry, it's the recognition of shapes, being able to talk about the properties of shapes, composing shapes, composing, and then measurement concepts around time, uh, weight, distance, and length. So it's it's the very basic foundational concepts in the early grades. Um, numeracy Boost is not a scripted approach. It's a set of strategies, approaches that teachers use and lessons using their curriculum and their lesson plans. Um, so we, we say that Numeracy Boost is a three-pronged approach because it works both inside the classroom uh, and outside the classroom, recognizing that there really isn't enough time during a class day to get at all of the skills and learning that children need to have in order to succeed in math or literacy um, in the four or five hours or less in some places that they have to spend in the classroom. So we have an outside of the classroom approach as well. Um, with, with the teacher training component that we focus on, we have five sessions that are day long that cover the different domains that I just mentioned. Um, and it's a focus on the content as well, so strengthening the content knowledge around those domains, but also on the pedagogy. So what are some of the approaches that are effective and appropriate to be using with young children when we're talking about early grades math instruction? Uh, the student assessment, it's a baseline end line kind of assessment, so it helps us see how children have progressed over the course of the intervention. It gives teachers valuable information about particularly areas that children are struggling in and how they can modify their instruction to support those children. And then it also gives us programmatically information about what we may want to improve on moving forward. The community component is that out of school component and we focus on parents and children. So we have um, something called Math at Home. Um, this is a, a Bangladeshi version of some of the activities. Uh, math at Home is meant for parents of all educational backgrounds. 
uh, to do simple activities in the home with their children. Things like when you're walking outside, can you count how many homes you see as you walk? Or when you are around the environment, what kind of shapes are you seeing in the environment? So it's very simple things that parents might not even recognize as math that they can do in the environment without having math skills necessarily. Um, and then the, the last community component, which is one of my favorites, is math clubs for children, where we have oops, a series of books that we've developed that talk about uh, math concepts like measurement. This one is about buying shoes and how do you know what size feet you have. Um, so it talks about developmentally appropriate lessons in math and progresses through those developmental progressions that Linda and Yasmin were talking about earlier, but presented in a really fun and dynamic, engaging way for children. So the story leads a discussion, which leads to a game, which shows that math has purpose and is relevant. And there's usefulness in math, and it's not just formulas that I need to memorize to get a grade on a test. Um, so, these are the countries that we've implemented numeracy boost in. We started in Malawi and Bangladesh in 2012, and we've added Pakistan, Egypt, and Ethiopia. And we will be um, starting in Mali, the Philippines, and Mexico. And we've also used numeracy boost content um, in a couple of emergency settings in Thailand, in refugee camps in Thailand, and in our child-friendly spaces in Jordan. So it's really an adaptable toolkit that can be modified for different contexts. Okay, so what are the instructional practices? Our categories might look different from what you've been hearing this morning, but they're talking about essentially the same things. Um, in a lot of the classrooms that we work in, math is very teacher-directed. There's a lot of memorizations of facts and formulas, a lot of copying from the board, and not too much opportunity for children to ask questions, to explain their reasoning, to clarify concepts, to have discussions. Um, and so with the types of approaches that we're helping teachers use in the classroom, we're really asking them to teach math completely differently from the way that they might have learned it and the way that they're used to teaching it. So we're asking them to change a lot of their math teaching and learning strategies through some of these. So first of all, we have um, a, a variety of different games and activities in the toolkit that help explain concepts in a different way because children benefit from learning concepts in a variety of different ways. So once the teacher has done a direct instruction or a small lesson, supplementing that with an interactive game just deepens the understanding of the children. Um, it also provides them for an opportunity to learn and to clarify their reasoning in a non-threatening place. So if I don't really understand place value, I don't mind asking Linda to explain it versus raising my hand and asking that or to explain place value again. So as an illustration of one of the games that we include, I'm hoping that you don't mind playing a game with me. Um, it's in the materials are difficult to find. Um, this game is called the Rubbish Pit. I know some of you might be familiar with it. Has anyone heard about this game? No? Yes? Okay, one person. So all you need is a <laughs> piece of paper, and I think everybody has paper. You can do it on your laptops as well. Um, and the objective of the game is to make the largest three-digit number possible through some rolls of the dice that I will be rolling. So what you need to do is to make three dashes on your paper or on your screen. And then one dash down here, this is your rubbish can. The garbage can, as we would say in America. <laughs> abstract concept of place value, um, which teachers can talk about and children probably won't understand right away. And so adding something like this to the discussion around place value really helps children make that abstract concept much more concrete. So the rules of the game are I'm going to roll the die four times. Every time I roll the die, I'm going to call a number. Your job is to take that number and place it somewhere along the three digits to make the largest three-digit number possible. Once you place your number, cannot move it. Has to stay there. You are allowed one roll or one number, but you can throw one of the numbers away. Does that make sense? So let's, let's, let's try it and then we'll see what happens. Can I, can I place them all later? Yes, I will try. When I practiced, I did five and six, so I get lucky. Yeah, we can place it right when you roll or later. 
No, no, right right when I roll. So I'm not going to call the next number until I make sure that everyone has a number on there. (laughs) All right. So here's the first roll. The three. So. So place that number where you want it. Here's the second one. Is everyone ready for the second roll? Okay. Oh. Six. There's a third one. Three again. And here's the last one. Six. So, we would like to share. Such a neighbor. Who would like to share their three digit number? Yes, in the back? 663. Okay, they copied. Was anybody able to make a number larger than 663? Why not? There were no. Can you. There was no. There wasn't, six was the largest number that we rolled. There were no larger numbers than that. What what number did people eliminate into the rubbish pit? Three. The three. Can you tell me why you eliminated the three and not the six? Um, I, I, I eliminated the second three. Uh-huh. And that was just kind of a, uh, since that's one of the lower possible ones, right. I, I was hoping that then the final roll would be higher than a three. Higher than three, exactly. So the game definitely is fun, right? And especially for young children who don't play a lot of games, perhaps it's a fun game, but it's the discussion at the end that's the more important part of the game, right? And that's the, the second bullet. So the approach that we're really trying to change in the math classroom is to question, to ask, why is that a reasonable answer? Why, why did you think there would be no more higher numbers than a six? Um, to really develop the deeper understanding of the concepts that we're not seeing in a lot of the classrooms that we work in. Um, and so asking questions like, is that a reasonable answer? Can you explain your answer a different way? Is there another way that you can attempt that problem and come to the right answer? So that kind of uh, questioning technique is something that is difficult to do, even for good teachers. It's hard. Um, so we're really asking a lot of our teachers. And we're trying to move away from this um, idea of one right answer. There's one right answer and there's one way to solve that to get that right answer. And trying to use mistakes as an opportunity to learn, right? So you, you didn't get the right answer. How did you solve that problem? What could you have done differently to arrive at where you need to get to? And then the final piece is incorporating materials like a number cube or dice that could be found relatively easily in the environment because children benefit from practicing skills using physical objects to clarify their thinking, to see different ways of doing things, particularly for concepts like uh, place value and also borrowing. You know, when we borrow, we're taking, looks like we're taking a one and putting it over to the ones column, but that's actually a 10. And so using popsicle sticks to demonstrate that or any kind of bundling type of activity really makes that idea more visual for children. Um, And then finally, just a few pictures, not finally, I have one more thing after this. So here on the bottom left, we have a math, in one of the math clubs in Bangladesh, the facilitator set up a store where children are buying and selling things using fake money. So they're seeing how math skills apply in everyday life. Uh, The bottom two pictures are everyday materials that have been transformed into math manipulatives in Malawi. So they have bottle tops over here to use as counters and then these boxes that they use for to talk about face value, ones and tens, and they just have some sticks. And then the top is a training in Bangladesh for, for SAVE staff and some of the ministry staff, um, where we talk about concepts like multiplication, which really are kids just multiply the times tables, but we're trying to link that to repeated addition to show the connections between multiplication and repeated addition so that it's more of a conceptual skill that children understand rather than some numbers that they're memorizing. And then to sort of support this whole idea of increasing games, manipulatives in the classroom, um, every classroom that we work in and every community 
it. And so this looks different in each of the contexts, but at a minimum, it will include some kind of um, some kind of number cube type object, some number cards, uh, counters that in the Bangladesh picture on the top are kernels of corn and little stones. In the Malawi picture, they're rocks. Um, a number line, and then a hundreds chart, some string perhaps to do measurement <coughs> work, and then the books that I mentioned. And then I will just share with you these two videos that I hope the videos run. The first one is grade one classroom in Malawi. And the teacher's name I don't have up there, but it's um, she's a teacher who has attended a lot of numerous cities training sessions. I think she's been years of numerous cities sessions. Um, quite an accomplished a lesson on very basic addition and subtraction concepts. Yeah, but I think I've clicked on this tab, and so I feel like the to talk about geometric shapes and using those tangrams to do a um,
very loud, I'm warning you. Uh, good morning. Good morning, good morning. teacher. <laughs> That's a good one. No, um, my name is Moses Iguare from African Population and Health Research Center. I see you all the way from Nairobi. Come and tell you about this. And I am a researcher, and uh, most of my daily work is to look at data. Okay. But then also look at data inside the classroom and what's happening inside the classroom and trying to characterize what we observe, what the teachers are doing in the classroom, what are the productive instructional strategies taking place inside the classroom. And today I'm going to share one of those observations based on an RCT that was implemented by RTI, and we evaluated that is called Itayari, good readiness, looking at four to five year olds and how the their teachers take them through. And then of course the RCTs have interventions, so it had interventions. It was a large one, about 600 schools. Um, in Kenya only, in three, uh, in four counties, in four counties, and okay. And what was happening is, you have various interventions. For example, there were three. One of them was looking at training the teachers on the best ways to help young children, four to five year olds. In literacy and numeracy, it was combined. 
And the second one was, apart from training the teachers on how to do that, and including the, the, the mentorship that the teachers need to get inside the classroom, you add learning materials. So the first one, you add learning materials, one-to-one, by -one, the child, teacher guides. Then there was a third one, where you have that second one, then you add certain uh, small things that have to do with the hygiene and health knowledge, washing your hands after using the toilets, um, all of the foods that you need to eat. Um, this is how you clean your hands. That was the third one. So, and all these were powered adequately and <clears throat> spread across the four counties. And then, of course, we had the control. Now, among the very many data that we are collecting there was doing classroom observation. We used the stalling um, protocol. I think most of you could be familiar with the stalling protocol. Then, of course, we did some modifications. And then we do that at baseline, we do that at midline, we do that at headline. <clears throat> now, the learners were not followed up to avoid teaching to the test. So every time we'd go to the classroom, every round, we do a new sample. In any case, they were being taught as one. Well. So really, if the program was changing, then change for the learners. Okay? But then, of course, the teachers were not always the same ones because this is PP2, PP1. So, and when a teacher gets to PP2, his or her children graduate to grade one, so he goes back or she goes back to PP1 and bring. So, if you go there next year, you might not find the, 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 the same, but both PP1 and PP2 teacher were all exposed. Okay. So, there's a quick background on what this is all about. And <laughs> I would still go into the corner. So <laughs> we're going to then walk you through the productive um, instructional strategy and what we think this is all about and what are those activities that we observed that probably could be reassembled so that they form a model or a framework that could improve the quality of uh, the teaching or of what's happening inside the classroom. And that's what um, this is all about. Then um, we grouped the observations into various categories, simply categorizing the kind of actions that are happening inside the classroom. But of course, this was done before going to the observation and looking at the literature and looking at uh, our other um, uh, our work that has happened previously. So one of them was the teacher focus. At any one single time during the lesson, where is the teacher focusing? The entire class like this, the way I'm doing, to an individual learner uh -huh, or to a group of learners? Or maybe could be off task or even outside the room. So we capture that. Then the teacher action. Yeah, he is focusing the entire group, but what exactly is he doing? He's reading to them the numbers. Or he is demonstrating how to add two plus three. And then we had a series of other activities that could constitute teacher focus, teacher action, sorry. Then we also had student action. So at that particular time when you are making that observation, what are the learners doing? Of course, here is, is mainly majority of the learners because you have very many uh, students in the classroom. Okay. And as you know, the stalling uh, spot check, spot observation, you make a swipe looking at each and every uh, corner of the classroom from one direction to the other, like 180, and you make it um, consistent every time that way. And during that um, snapshot that you do, you have to look at the teacher, you have to see majority of learners, what they are doing, and of course, other things. Apart from those three that we have there, there are others like, what was the instructional content? Okay, 
what were the materials being used, in which language. But for now, I think I'll zero on those um, three. Okay, what do we have here? Maybe a little bit of the context within which these observations were being done, because they influence the kind of behavior, the kind of actions, and the kind of activities that you'll find. And what we have in the first one is the average class size. This is among the best that you can find anywhere. And maybe I need to also mention that these were middle, low level income populations. That's where the schools are located. Some schools were also located within the lower test bracket. So the average class size between 20 and 30, that to us looks very okay, very good. You can manage that. I, I don't think you'll get anything uh, lower than this. And this is uh, urban context, although we also have uh, data for um, rural areas as well. Sorry, this is not urban context. This is the entire, this is the videos that are in the urban context. This is the entire uh, data set. This is the kind of uh, 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 class sizes that you get. And the reason being that the ECDs are very many. The schools at this level, they are very, very many because of the distance. So they are almost in each and every other um, uh, uh, village. Now, we also look at the teachers and uh, their qualifications. And yes, we had some teachers that were not trained. And this is what we are trying to, to show here. Of course, we have the other Oh, it's not reflecting on the point, yeah? I think so, it's not. So, yes, we have some untrained teachers and public schools, these are government schools. Uh, Albert schools, these are low cost private schools. Sometimes we call them informal and you'll find them in informal settlements, especially within the urban areas. Yeah? These are absolute <coughs> numbers rather than proportions except for the average uh, uh, class size that was a mean. Here we have years of teaching in ECD, trying to get a sense of the experience. Okay? And we find that in the low cost private schools, um, they disappear after five, four, five, six years. Okay, turnover is very high in those schools. But then in the government schools, yes, they have taught for quite some time. And probably there you'll have also an aging um, workforce. Again, yes, now we start getting to the little stuff and the little story. <clears throat> what I have in this slide, on this slide, is looking at the baseline and the end line, and then you compare the bottom 20% and the top 20%, and I can explain a little bit what this is. The bottom 20%, what we did is you look at the schools and how they performed at baseline. And then you rank them according to the to five quintiles. Okay? So the first, the bottom 20 up to the highest 20%. Then we decide, for whatever reason, just to pick the, top, the bottom 20 and the top 20 and look at what's happening in those classrooms. And one of the reasons was because we can find in the bottom 20, they had the highest gain. These are absolute gains in terms of percentage points, not standardized. Um, I know there are economists and statisticians in the room. <laughs> so, so these are just absolute uh, 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 percentage points. So again, Someone told me, oh, this could be an effect of uh, a ceiling effect. Maybe that's why you are finding you are top five, uh, the, 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 the top 20. They, do not, they don't seem to be gaining, they don't seem to be working for. Maybe this, this kind of intervention works best with the low performing uh, students, maybe. And that's also good enough. Um, So we tried to look at the teacher forecast and try to see whether there were any changes 
if you look at what is happening within the bottom uh, 20 bottom 20 percent the top 20 percent and you look at the difference between um, baseline and end line and looking at the same kind of an activity do you see any difference and does that tell us that probably the teaching practices of behaviors are changing because of this intervention that's the kind of thing that we are trying to see here now <clears throat> I've already shown the changes uh, that occurred or the, the if you look at the red arrows uh, at the end line for the public schools this is not public this is uh, private schools then we have the whole class the teacher was focusing on the whole class or on one individual learner or a small group there are certain things and we have seen that from the presentation that was done um, the, the video that we watched from uh, Elin where the teacher is actually talking to the entire class. Sometimes we say, hey, the teacher should be student-centered. But that does not mean that every time we see a teacher, for example, focusing on the entire class, that's, that, that is bad. Sometimes that can also yield some good results, depending on how that was done. And we see that one um, very, very many times, and it's very, very, very common. I can see some hearts up. Sorry, just a quick Yes, okay. not teachers. Sorry, not teachers. It's bottom 20% of the schools. The, the, the analysis was at school level. So you get an average for each and every uh, school. And then you rank the schools. And then you create the quintiles. Sorry for that. Okay, so yes, there were some changes in the way the teachers. Um, Are behaving inside the classroom for example we see an increase in the whole class we see also um there are problem here the arrow i'm trying to look at this this is 33 yeah. but this is 26. Yeah. so this arrow should be facing down yes yeah. this one went down but then here we don't seem to see we see some slides again. Um, change, uh, small drops, but then we don't see much in terms of the individual learner. This is the top 20, and this is the bottom. So in the bottom, we are seeing an increase in the whole class, and we are seeing a decline in the top. And yet, when you look at the results, the bottom ones gained more. If we go to the next one, again, we're looking at teacher action during numeracy. These are the public schools. What we have here, again, monitoring, asking questions, and demonstrating. Now, the monitoring learners, the teacher moves around the class and trying to see that the learners are conducting or carrying out that activity that was given the assignment, the task that was given. And in asking questions, of course, uh, the teacher is asking the questions. And then in demonstrating here, um, it could be like what Erin did with us in the morning. That this is how you go about adding these two numbers, or conducting or carrying out this task. What do we find in the bottom school then there was an increase in monitoring the learners. Uh, but then there was a drop or no change in the others. Now, in the top schools, the ones that did not have any much gain in terms of the test scores, again, <laughs> <laughs> everything went down. <clears throat> There's no change. The, the, the behavior changed. Of course, there is a caution here because these are two data points at the beginning, at the end. Maybe we needed to do several of this before uh, we show this, but of course that can be very expensive also. I want to skip this because again, it's the same thing, but we are looking for the low cost private school okay? and probably look at the uh, student action. 
So what were the students doing and what kind of changes did we find in the student behavior when they are learning um, numeracy? Again here, <clears throat> some of the activities that students carry out, the ones that we found be very, to be dominant, be frequently used, okay? And these are the kind of activities that probably, if I, 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 I borrow from, um, I think it's Aline who talked about the five steps, okay? So, if the five steps then were to apply, how would they apply in classrooms where you have recitation, being very um, uh, heavily used, where you have listening, they're just listening, of course we know that children learn in different ways. Okay? There are some who use their eyes, others listening, and, and so forth. So, yes, they were there listening, also answering questions, and of course the individual desk work. This is very common in mathematics, where you give the student a task, they all sit as individuals, and they start doing it. Again, we observe those kind of things. So, how then do we use the five steps, for example, when we have these kind of things? How do you integrate that into it? Now, what we found here is a mixed, um, um, results because we find for example like the recitation went drastically down these are percentages of course in the bottom 20 percent but we find the same even in the top and probably Maybe it has something to do with the way the teachers were being trained or taught or being told what to do, and probably, what is the recitation? When the students are doing something and you tell them, um, uh, this, is, this is a child, this is a child, they are reciting, it's like cute recitation, and very, very, very common, uh, you find that one very, very common in, in these classes. Again, when you go to the top, 20% um, looking at the listening. In both cases, we find that um, students were listening more than they were listening at the deadline. So the individual Pro desk, yes, the sorry. desk is declined for both. The individual desk was declining for both. The citation went down for both. I'm talking about also the individual desk, if you look at the baseline, to be you did your desk work. Yes, yes. yes. you did that. Yes. You did that because, again, we are associating this one with the intervention where probably uh, the instructions were that individual desk work sometimes is very passive and you want students to be more active, to be doing things maybe in groups, to be doing things maybe when they are answering questions rather than them going <laughs> sitting alone and doing this. Remember, these are four to five year old. So. Um, that wasn't uh, surprising, but we also think that it could have also contributed to the kind of scores that we are seeing uh, there. Again, um, a few lessons learned. I'll go back to the video after this. A few lessons learned is teachers use their pedagogical knowledge and context in their choice of productive instruction uh, strategies. Um, in, the, in the earlier one, there was I choose. Okay, two minutes remaining. Then, monitoring learners, asking questions and demonstration are some of the active teaching activities that we find very, very common in numeracy classrooms. And then the question is how teachers could take advantage of that to use um, the productive instructional strategies to inbuild um, them into monitoring learners, in when they are monitoring learners, when they are asking questions, how can they do that? We also think uh, so that uh, in numerous teachers influence learners to engage in activities they consider to be active. Now, because of the training and what they receive, sometimes even when it is not systematic, sometimes even when it's not necessary to do that, you'll find teachers doing it. Okay, and then of course here the question is, and in terms of training, is whatever active activity that the teachers have to engage with, how does it contribute to learning? How is it systematic? 
how does it relate to what activity that was done earlier or the preceding activity? And you find a lot of disjointed activities, but they're active, but they're disjointed activities. And we're going to see that uh, in the next um, slide. Not in the next slide. Yes, this is acknowledgement. Probably is slide number six, if it is still here. Yeah. Let's see whether this will work. This looks active. Let's control. Okay. So what we have here are two teachers teaching the same thing, but in different classes, but within the same environment or very close environment. The schools were not very far from each other, and they were drawing. Um, is it loading? Okay, give it time. Okay. It's very sure it's <laughs> Ah, yeah. Now, when I see that, now I know it's coming. This is number 
If this is number 11, I want somebody to come and count for the last 11 objects. 11? question is then teacher one or teacher two who belongs to bottom 20 percent who belongs to top 20 percent now how did you tell now you can see how complicated uh, making classroom observation is because we know the results but when you go inside the classroom you sort of seem to see similar things. Of course, there are a lot of other things that you need to be controlled for, like the student behavior, where they come from, blah, blah, and all those things. And that's why we try to take the video in schools that are drawing children from the same river. And both of them are public, uh, public schools. But it happened that in teacher two, that school fell in the top, the top 20%, and the first teacher the, the school was within the bottom 20%. But it just tells you how complicated making some of these observations can be because we are seeing almost the same. But then when we look at the results, they look different. Trees. Then telling us then we need to make uh, more deeper dives, looking at the, the, the activities and, and, and then linking them to the I want to stop there. Thank you very much. Well, um, Rebecca, before you start, yeah. um, because we only have less than an hour, right? It's about 45 minutes. But yeah, what, we were originally stopped, scheduled to stop at 12, which would only give us 15 minutes for discussion. So we'd like to welcome any who can stay till 1230 to stay. We can have a little bit more rich discussion. Those who have to leave, of course, we understand. Great. Well, thanks, Janae. Thanks to Yasmin, uh, Linda, Norma, Shireen, and Moses, um, and to all of you. And this is obviously a great privilege for me because the other option was the meeting on the trip report policy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when Yasmin said, do you want to spend the morning of the 24th at RTI, I said, yeah. <laughs> but I know you all did, too. So I'm uh, going to go ahead and ask our presenters to come up. I think that was the idea. Um, but while that's happening, hang on, sit back down. <laughs> uh, would you please, we've heard a lot, and we've seen a lot, and we've had a lot to think about, um, you know, starting out with the, the paper on the instructional strategies and the promising strategies as framed in the paper from the 24 research studies on through the uh, potential uh, five-step model for the instruction of mathematics, which I think was very intentionally set out to differentiate itself from the uh, familiar I do, we do, you do. Uh, so that was interesting um, to the, the work that has happened at Literacy Boost um, and then to some of this, you know, very pertinent commentary on classrooms and what does it look like when it's good? And then to use the phrase of the woman who gave my daughter her first tangrams, what is good enough? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, when it's good, what is good enough, right? So how are we making these judgments about what's what we want to see, what we don't want to see? Uh, and then how are we measuring whether that's productive or not? All these loaded words, right, for the students that we're working with. So we've, we've had a very rich morning. Um, and so what I'm going to do is ask all of you, while our presenters get themselves organized, to find someone with whom you have not paired yet and to talk about one major takeaway that you share and one question that the two of you agree you would like to ask the panel. And you have about six minutes to do that. So get to it. <laughs> <laughs> 
professionalization of the teacher and the teacher's mastery of the content knowledge and their ability to feel comfortable discussing one, two, three, four, five, or who knows how many strategies for one half divided by one quarter. Um, maybe I've been working at a donor for too long, but that sounds expensive. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree with Derek Bach. That's actually almost the only thing I can uh, on. But, but, you know, I think we are going to, I feel a little bit Groundhog Day, actually, frankly, about this whole thing. Uh, when Education Development Center hired me some very large number of years ago, the very first thing I was hired to work on, and there's a woman sitting here who was quickly drafted into it, was a literacy and numeracy program for every child in the Republic of Guinea for grades one through six. And we'd written a beautiful proposal and it was gonna be an integrated model. And yeah, I mean, you can see where I'm going with that, right? It's actually probably mathematics teaching in PETA in Guinea today in 2018 looks very much like it did quite possibly in 1990-something, fill in the blank. <laughs> um, so, so what do we do with the teacher core? And you know, yes, we all desperately want every child to be taught math the way Norma taught it to us this morning. And yes, we want every math teacher to be able to do what Norma can do, trained by Canada, and here she is today, uh, able to do that in English and French, but how much more? Um, so I, for me, that's one of the major. Would be able to work well with a model that's about choice. Presenting it here, but I think that's a challenge that's that's right out there. Um, some other challenges that come straight to the fore are the question of standards, benchmarks, and then more general standardization, right? Does, does good math teaching have some sort of core that would be the same from, you know, Bangkok to, to Bali, like, <laughs> you know, from San Francisco to uh, the Golden Arches? I, is it the same somehow in some way that can be captured um, and then some way that can be measured? Uh, or is it, you know, completely organic and different every time? And 
these, these competencies that we talk about being taught in a progression, does the progression look different uh, in one place than another, or one population than another? I think that's all going to quickly have to get answered. Um, I think uh, we need to be realistic about what we can learn from, from past experience, right? Um, and what, frankly, we can borrow, right? The six T's model that quickly became, as we all knew it, the five T's model. There are hallmarks in there that, that still resonate for me, right? We're going to have to talk about time. It's quite obvious when you watch these videos. <laughs> the time that it would be, that would be required for every child in that Malawian classroom <laughs> to be able to kind of be on point and ready to go in the progress monitoring stats. Enormous, right? And that was a small Malawian. So we're going to have to talk about time. We're going to have to talk about, and I think this is really a huge elephant in the room, language. In what language is mathematics taught? And when I teach a bunch of six-year-olds, one quacha, two quacha, three quacha, is it a little bit like Ramona Quimby and Harold the Angel, as in Arc the Harold the Angel? If anybody knows the Ramona Quimby stories, she thinks that Christmas Carol is about an angel named Harold. <laughs> right? One quacha is probably a cardboard cutout. Like this could be one quacha. Right? So we're going to have to talk about language, much the same way as we had to talk about it when we all started to get into the research basics. We've already mentioned the teaching. We're going to have to talk about materials and their cost. Where's Linda? But just have to leave. Linda and I spend our days thinking about Linda from the Global Book Alliance. Spend our days thinking about materials and their cost. Why is it that it, it you can go into these classrooms and think, gee, the first thing I need to do here is hire save the children to make kits with bottle caps? <laughs> why, why is that? That's weird. Why don't we just have the materials that we need to have the materials, right? And then we're going to have to think about testing. And actually, I'll stop here, but. Um, that's that's one of the questions that came out for me this morning was that um, uh, Linda, your paper and Shere um, and Yasmin, your paper looked at 24 studies that that were effective, um, but in the write up, it's it, there's not a lot of detail about what measures were used to say they were effective. So what was tested at the end of all that, and how? And then back to this question of what progress on a test means that we've gotten far enough, right? Um, we're going to have to talk about all of that. We're going to have to talk about, do we time the tests? Do we not time the tests? Do we pair the tests with a Stallings observation form uh, and look at what was happening to judge or, or interpret the results? This whole package is going to need to be Um So for me, there are, and then there, there are more uh, that are going to come to you from the donors who I will temporarily I sit down. So what about the role of technology? Eh. What do we do for children with disabilities? Eh. How much of these, how many of these skills and how much of this content should be covered before the child arrives in grade one? So that in grade one, we're doing whatever the norm is of 4 a grade one norm math curriculum. Eh. Um, and then, and I thought this was a sort of very interesting piece to your work, Moses. Um, Low-cost private schools. So not wildly different, and I'm no statistician and everyone knows it, but not wildly different, not strikingly different of the sort that you would sort of read your morning paper and think, wow, that's so different data going on there. So, you know, are these the panacea? Do they work for everything? Uh, or they are they just kind of a different version of something we see so very often? Um, your data speaks more to B than to A, but if we're going to engage with, and certainly if a donor is going to finance any work in a low-cost private school, uh, it better be because there's some upside. Um, and so how do we get there, and then does getting there in that environment imply doing anything differently from what we would just do? So I'll leave my commentary there, but let's kind of do a sweep of the room. So did you guys have, or did any, but would anybody like to <laughs> mention it? And just do takeaways first, and then we'll end. I'll send, yeah. Oh, there was, I, I loved your comments because I think we there were a lot that we actually touched up on. The one that I didn't hear you mention that I kind of was curious about was we haven't talked about gender, and I feel like girls are always told you're bad at math, right? 
So I and I'm sort of curious was there any disaggregated aggregated data or there was any extra effort to see where that starts from and how that contributes to math learning. It looks like we should go maybe right into questions. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Hopefully somebody's I'm noting these down up here. <laughs> okay. You want to take a few and then yes, I'll take a couple. So girls, girls always your first year first you learn you're a girl, then you did that come out in the data or do we anticipate that it will and most of we do to be sure that it doesn't. Um, okay, other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, you have, you have underscored that the important role teacher plays in bringing the required change in subject. So, how frequently do we carry out assessment of teacher knowledge, skills, yeah. competencies yeah. in delivering mathematics to other I mean, other levels? Because this will inform what kind of trainings or what kind of packages that we need to develop for them to address their challenges. So, how frequently do we carry out the same agile of teachers? Like, I'm just going to add on that, and my, thank you for everything you've shared with us. Uh, one of the things that I always wonder is, like, we do all this research, and, and it reflects uh, something that me is meaningful. But when we look at uh, a like Moses, is the data are kind of not necessarily what we expect, uh, or they, and then you ask more questions. But in any case, I'm thinking like a lot of times when you. Um, an intervention or a strategy like the five steps. It makes perfect sense to us, but it looks very different in the classroom because the, um, the attitude, the mindset is very, very different. So the translation is more mechanical, it doesn't necessarily flow. So how do you introduce some of the strategy? How much do you follow up? And how much do you stick with those teachers so they become a model so they can spread it out? Because I think in countries, in the little countries, like Africa, Ethiopia, um, that's what I hear a lot. So teachers need the help. They're very open to accept it, and they're willing to advance to it, especially now that I do mentoring with uh, teachers in the uh, conflict region. But the question is, just sending them an idea and saying this will work and try it out it just doesn't seem to be really, uh, doesn't bring the results that we expect it to do. So what do we do in terms of our donor communities and uh, what do we do locally as, as a school base? How much do we uh, stay with, stick with them, get the feedback, continue it till they understand them, and they can actually translate into others? So, yeah, I think there are two big questions. How long do you support the teacher, and then how do you get the donor to support you as long as it's going to take? But I think at some point, when a, a strategy works, I think teachers can take it on their own. In other words, yeah. Um, but they need to under get to that point where they get it, not just for the data collection, but more, more so because they do understand the effects in the classroom. Right. So the assessment, is, the evidence is definitely uh, important. Do you have more questions? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the data collection. And I'm also, I have sometimes issues with our assessment in mathematics because often it's about procedural fluency, our memorization of facts sometimes, so how quickly can we do this? And I wonder if there anything else we could get to before that that might help us show, okay, this child is developing this sense of number or understands this, but we may not be able to see it in, in some of the tests that we are doing in early grade classrooms. The very first question was on, on girls and gender. Um, I'm going to defer to Yasmin in just a second. So um, from what I've seen in the data, people do look at gender differences in mathematical outcomes, their, their knowledge. Um, and from what I recall, it actually varies. Right? So sometimes girls do better and sometimes boys do better. And in the intervention, sometimes girls do better than boys. Um, so there's not a consistent, despite this thing about girls not feeling good about their mathematical abilities, that it's not a given that girls are going to do more poorly. And actually, you might have that on yeah. that. I, th I think the data shows more in the early grades, it's harder to tease out. 
as students go older, so as they get to primary, end of primary, upper primary, end of primary, early secondary, that's where you start to see those gender differences. And I think the, the early years is a time to address it, right? So the early years can be a time to address it. So I think it's definitely something to, to look at. But yeah, you're right. It's a very early years just looking at, if you were to just look at that, you don't see very many. It's, it's later that you start to see those differences. Um, we just finished a five country trend analysis in the five countries that I mentioned earlier, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, uh, Malawi, Pakistan, and we find that um, boys at baseline are, are ahead of the girls in most of the subskills that we're measuring on our assessment. And in a few countries, Ethiopia and Pakistan, notably girls have caught up on a majority of the subskills, but in the other countries they haven't. Um, so we are still seeing a lag of girls uh, behind boys, and this has been very informative for us to help us improve um, our sort of practices around math and what we talk to teachers and classrooms about. And that we had we had a one pager outside. I don't know if we have any more copies left, but um, that study is going to be available very soon. Yeah. Yes, we were able to disaggregate the data by uh, girl boys, and girls did better at that level. Also, in terms of the enrollment, we had more girls in enrolled at that level than boys. And in terms of the teachers, we found uh, if you analyze those videos more closely, of course, some people can tell the difference between the two. If you analyze them more deeply, we found in terms of questions, for example, girls are being asked questions that would require yes, no. They're not being given an opportunity to learn, and not being a, an opportunity to think deep. But when it comes to boys, for example, you find them being asked a question where they have to explain something. That means they are being given an opportunity to actually think more deep. Because those are the kind of differences that we find. Let's move on to the question about um, how frequently to assess, uh, what to assess, how to assess, and then how to uh, sort of triangulate that with any teacher data that we have. That's sort of a big field of play. Who would like to start? <laughs> Norma. <laughs> 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 I was going to say this uh, Not a passion that I have. No. But, uh, <laughs> not your favorite. I, no, no, no. But, the question but, I, but I do think that Mary's that the quickest and the easiest thing to evaluate is procedural fluency. And yet, we know that procedural fluency with sexual understanding is only going to get a child somewhere around middle school, and then it's going to not going to hold together beyond middle school. Um, so we need to do, we need to find some very simple tools that will capture that mathematical reasoning, um, whether I understand the relationship between concepts or um, and and that really deep conceptual understanding because that's what we need to see in, in early primary as well as procedural fluency. What we need procedural fluency built on a strong conceptual understanding. Um, there are some tools that are coming out. It's whether or not we can get them in a simplified format that can be administered to someone who's not uh, a, a specialist in mathematics, but we really need to find a better way of capturing that deep understanding. I, was say, I think uh, one of our uh, recommendations is that we really need to look more at um, how uh, teacher practice. So if an intervention comes in, how do the teachers pick it up? Do they continue it later on? And what knowledge do they gain through it um, with regard to practices and with regard to actual knowledge of mathematics? So that's one of our big recommendations that we don't have data on them. That would be very helpful. Um, repeatedly testing teachers. I think my hope would be that you get them to a point and then you just kind of stop. That, that, yeah, no one likes you know, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not that it's not valuable, um, but I think that, it, um, that uh, encouraging teachers to take part in that process would work a lot better than kind of a top down sort of thing. I have just one thing to add about, oh, sorry, just to, about, about the EGMA is. We, we have talked about this a little bit, but one thing, the EGMA, the way it's being administered is to, you get, you know, the procedural results. But if you actually look at students' responses, which is something that's not that hard to capture because the assessor's already there, you can get a lot more insight. So if they're doing simple addition, 
what types of answers they're giving, if you did an analysis of that, you can actually get a different level of understanding than just correct and correct. So that's something to look at is look at our existing tools and see are there ways to gather the data on our existing tools that are give us a better insight into what children do. Yeah. Um, yes, again on assessment, <laughs> again on assessment, and uh, the question is uh, the predictors of they being numerously proficient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's actually question four, Rosemary. But go ahead. Yes. And they are related to. Uh, yeah. Now, um, we we we've done some work on having shield processing. I think uh, Deepa knows about it, uh, and it predicts the proficiency. In numeracy. Of course, there could be other aspects uh, that could be measured that also predict um, uh, numeracy proficiency. But I think that's one aspect that uh, I've seen and done it. And you can really predict uh, how they're going to if once you know how they are in terms of magnitude processing, even as at that level. And this could be things like um, being able to tell this is bigger than this one, you give them balls and they can pick the, the, the big ones, we we'll give them numbers and this, they can pick the small ones if that's what we want them to pick. And, and if they're able to demonstrate that, uh, those, those kids have been shown also to be good in uh, better life in the Which would make the question, not very good at magnitude processing. What are you that? <laughs> Or back, you need to walk it. So, just one more before we take another set of questions was your question, um, the colleague Sophia. Um, these, these, and it goes a little bit back to what Helen was saying. You know, models that we can create in Washington at USA or in a nice training room at RTI. Uh, how do we contextualize them? What do we do about uh, making them make sense in context for the asking to have used them? Um, and how long do we? You know, how long do we keep support? You know, what do we do? What's the timeline on that? What's the length of intervention? And, and when do we feel confident saying, okay, I don't need to really be visiting this class for more than a quarter or twice a year? How do we gauge all this, all this knowledge and move it into context? I just have a quick, quick thought on that is, and this is something about your, your question initially about. You know, is there something about mathematics that's the same universally versus what are the things that are not the same and how can they be contextualized? And I think, I think that's a really interesting question and something that we don't necessarily have like a ready answer to. I mean, I think we need more research about that. But I do think there are, you know, like the idea of wanting students to explain and justify. I think we want that. And I think that's a sign of really understanding mathematics. But what it looks like in Egypt may be very different in like Liberia. I was talking to someone about Liberia, which is a very different context, very different students and classrooms and teachers. So maybe there's a way that you have this base idea of like, this is what we want kids to get to, but it looks different. It looks different in Liberia versus Kenya versus, you know, Egypt versus Nepal. It's so conditioned, right? I mean, I married into a culture where if you're young, you don't speak up when the adults are so already there's a lot packed around this explanation. Yes, yeah. but yeah, Norma or Shereen just to actually add that. to what Yasmin said. I think for um, for math, it's probably even more important the whole idea of mentorship and having sort of their mentors or a head teacher that can serve as sort of a role model or a guide more so than in literacy. I think. I, I learned the best of my teaching from Teresa Chidas, who taught next door to me and it, when I taught fourth grade, you know, and so I think for math, it's really critical to have these people who serve as models for teachers, and I think there are great teachers in the countries that we work in that we really need to develop uh, the skills of to serve as that sort of mentor for that school. Um, I would add to the, this whole fidelity to implementation question. and. and the fact that sometimes the mathematics that you see doesn't look anything like the mathematics that you expect it to. But I, I think we have to acknowledge that the teachers that we're working with don't necessarily bring very, very strong conceptual understandings of a lot of this mathematics. And it's really hard to have children experience place value in a meaningful way if you can't. So I do think that we have to focus some of the in-service uh, around getting teachers comfortable and building their own conceptual understanding. 
getting them comfortable with talking about math ideas. And I think we have to do that more in, in numeracy than we have to do in literacy. Generate a sense of story for the Molly and Susan. Yes, but getting them comfortable, right? Getting them able to do that dialogue is what's build, going to be the prereq yeah, for that. You have to build the understandings that they, they don't that they don't come in because a lot of their teaching has been very, very narrow and procedural. And that you may not be able to explain double digit addition other than, you know, bring up and just do. You just right. do it. But why you do it that way, if, if you don't know why, then it's really hard to explain to them. All right. Can I just do a follow-up? I, I do One agree that the, the, uh, the question is, um, when we use data, for example, Ethiopia was used as one of the ones that had that intervention. At the same time, we still have questions about, you know, kids still failing or dropping out of grade two in mathematics. So the reason I was asking that question is like, yes, we do know that the teachers are not necessarily equipped to fully understand it, but when, you, when we use that's data about Ethiopia, for example, being one of the countries used. I'm just trying to figure out the gap. So how long do we stay in? How, how, you know, like what effects do we have? Region would be helpful so that, you know, for the next person to go and then we know where to carry it on. So that's just kind of why I'm saying that. So with the dollar community, I think sometimes that information, there's a reputation going on, I think. At the, at the end, 30 years later, we still have the same problem. So I'm yeah. just thinking, um, you know, what do we do about the teachers? I think we always have for the teacher. We have the strategies, but how do we translate that into in service and eventually pre service? But in service seems to be a very easy country where the pre service is really driven by top down. So anyway. And I mean, I don't think we're going to find, I think these are the questions that, you know, kind of shine a light on the path ahead for the next five or ten years, um, well, particularly in a context, for example, USAID where I currently work and Melissa and Linda, who, well, you know, we increasingly give money into these gigantic grants and the government of places like Ethiopia will write a grant paper saying, yes, I can take $250 million uh, and I can make better math teachers. Well, then we need to help, you know, then we have to get involved with making sure that happens because that's where the big injection of money is going to right. have an impact on pre-service and in-service patterns. So it's complex. I don't think we'll answer it this morning. Let's take another one. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there were, if there were studies done, and it doesn't possibly look like there may have been because there's less of this in the U.S. anyway, but art to teach math and reading, like arts-based or brought more generally project-based as well, kind of, and arts-based and just project-based. Um, I, I was an art teacher for five years, and so like that would, that would be like, because art is so symbolic, it's abstract, but, and it's also very concrete, you have to execute it, um, which is very similar. Taking that abstraction, translating it, Does it exist? Are there, yeah, are there studies? Yeah, are there studies? So um, I don't do math or literacy. I am <laughs> school health and nutrition. So what am I doing here, right? So I think there's been a lot of effort. I mean, we go from um, education access to quality being literacy, but now, oh, quality is not just literacy, it's numeracy. I like to think not just literacy, it's not just numeracy, but it's also some health skills and nutrition. So I'm kind of curious about how do we, and, and it's so hard to do literacy, it's so hard to do numeracy, but you do want the children to actually come out of it, not just doing math and reading, but other skill sets. So I guess the question is like, what are the data sets, what are we, you know, we're trying to get more interested in numeracy, but at the same time, how do we do that? And how do I get a new topic like health and nutrition? How do we introduce that to the donor community, which is already feeling like, oh my God, we can't do this, it's so hard, and so it's just, there's so much lack of evidence. And I, I did, when you said you dropped all those non-RCTs and non-quasi, um, I was like, I know there are other stuff that's not, not RTCs and not, that there's, you can mine so much more of that, right? So 
it's a big question like at what level of evidence do you can you actually introduce new topics and then also what's where's the limit like I want us to do more health than nutrition but and both of you are on a sort of similar line of inquiry there because questions trend towards for example how could you practice math across the curriculum literacy skills across the curriculum or how could you just throw the entire curriculum into the Indian Ocean and start again say if you were working in Madagascar so that you could build something more integrated <laughs> um, but, but that's this question of you know we're not going to get we aren't going to get in the Malawis of our world past this double shift day right so everyone is coming to school Max three and a half to four hours. Of that three and a half to four hours, we have to take away the time to go to the bathroom, the time to hang out in the courtyard, the time to punch the kid you don't like, uh, and the time to lose and find your lunch. Okay, great. Get you deworm. Have to, like, we also have to take away get deworm, and we have to take away the time to lose your slate and find it again. So now we have an hour and ten minutes of instructional time. What do we do? And I am not standing here with the answer, and I don't know. But you guys are asking questions that head in that direction, right? How do I get the MART instructions? How do I take other things into account? How do I get themes woven in here? We'll, we'll ask the panel in a second. I'll take one more because I see a hand or two more. I see a hand on the side. Go ahead. So, Jerry Mendez, um, how do, Rebecca, maybe this is the donor question. How do we deal no, with time for me to go. the absence <laughs> of preconditions for differentiated learning, for quality instruction? The double classroom, the, the 60 kids in a class, why aren't we addressing that as a precondition before we get into the five steps of how to teach math? Probably is the donor question, but I wrote it down. <laughs> I go back to a question that a lady raised early on. Are we, there seems to be some sort of agreement in a deep understanding of the presentation, are important to learn? Uh, math skills early on is that this is science to support that that's the way kids learn uh, yeah. uh, math or mathematics. do we yeah. I mean that's question. the way okay let's go through that set um, maybe I'll start actually with that one because you're right it's been asked twice so to the panel now um, what do we have from our friends in neuroscience on mathematics instruction how are we understanding how the brain builds these um, so I'll take a first swing at it. So um, I actually belong to a network of math researchers in the United States. So we look at this, a lot of this comes out of France as well. Um, and we do... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and so uh, one of the things that we do know is that there are certain things that do predict later in mathematics. We're not sure exactly why, for instance, magnitude um, is a big predictor. There are other predictors like cardinality. David Geary just came out with a paper uh, that knowing cardinality, the earlier you understand cardinality, so cardinal, sorry. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you didn't catch your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so cardinality is, if you ask a very young child, how many fingers am I holding? If I do this many, so this thing probably say five. If you ask this, they'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then a very young child, if you say, so how many, how many are there, they'll say, one, two, three, four, right. They don't have cardinality. If they answer nine, because that's the last number they counted, then they understand that what they just counted is the quantity of those cardinality. So that turns out to be a very strong predictor, the age at which they get cardinality of later mathematical understanding. Um, we do know that those children who under who have what we might call math facts. Later on, so like fifth and sixth grade, if they have those as almost uh, automatic, then their brains can then concentrate on other higher parts of the mathematics, right? So, so in algebra, moving numbers around, right? moving numbers around, regrouping. Um, but we also know, just like in reading, even though rapid automatic naming of objects is predictive, nobody runs around in early literacy making children say names of objects really fast. Yeah. Right, we just don't do that because it's, it, it is a predictor, but it doesn't mean that you're supposed to run around and go teach rapid automatic names. So I think, um, and then the other part is that the research shows that the children who do uh, procedural or fluency, things like that, uh, the ones that really do well also do that in conjunction with um, conceptual understanding. 
and that uh, the procedural, for the most part, for those children who do well, also have a deep understanding. Well, maybe not early on a deep understanding, but they have a deep understanding. Um, so they go hand in hand. As far as like automatically teaching very young children to either identify objects, numerals, alphabet really fast, even though those are predictors, you don't see people running around doing that because there's not evidence that doing that sort of thing is going to make them a better reader or that it's going to make them a better reader. The other thing is that we're also thinking about the long game. We're thinking about what is going to help middle school students exist in school and create that human capital that is needed in countries to you know, enable the workforce. Um, so it's not just getting this fluency down right now so they can be able to the egg on the faster way. So I know we've got other questions, but I mean, uh, Stanislas de Haen, de Haen, de Haen, not de Haen, right? Right. I think it's de Haen. I think one thing, it's not French. It's not yeah. French. Yeah. yeah. But so that's how I think that's it. The, that's the sum of the research from the Institute of France that he runs referenced here. And I do think that both your questions are important because we don't, I really, really don't want us to have to live through I referenced my time in Guinea in the mid-90s. I don't want to have to live through the whole cycle on the same timeline again, right? I don't want to have to spend, you know, another, I don't have it left in my career, right? To spend another 18 years meeting to find out about the neuroscience of math so that I can spend two years understanding some of the basics of it so that I can actually apply it in my work. Like, I'd like to collapse this timeline. So I think that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, question, the other thing I'm coming, Helen, I see your hand. Um, the other thing that strikes me is, you know, I think we're all headed toward a discussion of what needs to be um, just practiced and taught in a fairly straightforward way for 300 children packed in a hot room, and what money needs to be spent on things that are a little more colorful and fun. So is cardinality, and I, I do not know the answer to this question, but I'm trying to provoke thought. Is cardinality something that you could drill for the class of 300 kids? I don't know the answer. But, you know, are there things that because of the places where we work, we just kind of have to accept are going to be, quote unquote, from our Western perspective, boring parts of the lesson, but it's it's somehow providing a basic skill that is needed. And I don't know the answer, but I think neuroscience might help us figure that out. So I'll leave that at that. Back to the curriculum friends and Math across the curriculum, studies on art to teach math, um, how we blend this all together in one nice way in an hour. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we, I, I don't know of any projects that have been done to, to reference um, your question, but um, we, we have something at Save the Children called Heart, healing and, um, healing and learning through the arts. Anyway, but they use an integrated approach uh, in those classrooms where they talk about different skills as in one session. So they're using art to discuss science, to discuss math, to discuss literacy. Um, we don't do that in a lot of our settings. It's mostly targeted to children who've gone through some sort of trauma or stress or emergency kind of settings. Yeah, yeah. But then they address the uh, curricular areas through that framework as well. I don't know, thank you. Okay. So one thing about, um, so I think someone mentioned something about a project-based approach. Or, you know, project-based approach is lovely, it's beautiful, it looks fantastic. But again, like a classroom with 300 students, depending on where we are, it's also, it's very difficult for a teacher to do. And I think one of the things that we want to think about is, I mean, even I, I taught in this country where we had a lot of resources, but teachers didn't necessarily know the project approach and what it if you it turns into extending the theme so much that it becomes like you know your whole classroom is covered with cows because you are studying <laughs> the farm and we we're going to count something so I had you know I remember as a classroom teacher cutting out like 50 cows for my kids to count and I spent so much time on it but did that really help them mathematically Probably not. You know that that it's just it yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretend these are cows. And just, yeah. you know, they just I just think we sometimes we the project approach becomes a thematic approach, which becomes everything has to be about this one or stretching base to the point where they don't make sense anymore. And I don't know if we necessarily want to go that route. Right. And I would so. concur with her. In addition to that, teaching with a project approach and making sure that you pay attention to health, which you should. 
and nutrition, which you should, and art takes a very talented yeah. teacher. A very highly, highly trained teacher. So I taught for 14 years, maybe about year 10, somewhere around there. I was pretty good at this. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And we, we don't have, I mean, from a donor perspective, at least how surprise anyone, but we don't have 10 years to wait. Right? We, how, whatever measures we choose and whatever rubrics we are looking at to judge whether we're making any progress or as the U.S. Great. Um, <laughs> but whatever, however it is we define that we're doing that, we're going to need to get going on doing it or we're not going to keep getting the money to keep trying. So we don't have a ton of playtime to sort of how many cows we can cut out, and <laughs> how long we can extend the theme. Um, and I mean, you know, I stand here having been both raised in the tradition at home and in my education uh, to think that that's the right way to go. But how do we get some kind of a shortcut? Because we don't want to. So um, assessment uh, of preconditions. Uh, so yeah, we, we do not do a great job. And we never hold the line, right? So about a month ago, uh, we were all asked in our office to read the cheap application from the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. And imagine how much money they were applying for, right? They've had an extra set of three zeros. So not the usual set of three zeros, another extra one on the back. Um, who knows where that money's going? We do terribly as the donor community. Wait a second, if we're going to give you a billion and some dollars as the GPE community, maybe there are some things that are, quote unquote, to use your word, preconditions that have to be there. Um, another favorite example of mine, the Republic of Mali has a law on the books from way back when, and you can ask Penelope about it, saying every child will have two books, a French book and a math book. How many children did I see in six years in the country that had that? Absolutely not. Right? We do nothing to make those preconditions come to the fore. And frankly, I don't think the donor community in the next 20 years, I don't see it happening. I, others might disagree with me, but I never have observed it. I've never seen us walk away. I've never seen us hold a line. I've never seen us say, you've got to make some changes to your pre-service curriculum or we test. I don't think it's coming. <laughs> so there you go. Um, okay, last set of questions, and I am going to get Helen in on this. Anyone besides Helen have a question? Ask her. What? With, with the donor community kind of looking to grassroots organizations as opposed to government? Well, USA. Like USA yeah, and then, then we'll go to Helen. I mean, USA pretends to do that. Um, and I don't really have mandate to speak for any other donor. Um, you know, USAID has a whole small business apparatus. Uh, USAID has the occasional practice of taking on the country level. We that in Washington. I was just thinking that makes it a little bit easier to have that accountable uh, accountability for the. I mean, I I hope so. I know, right. <laughs> Um, I will. I, I will say that you know again to to take the lessons from what we learned decades that we've learned. having all the success in the world or all the data in the world or all the world or all the justification doesn't seem to shift the you know, bedrock dynamics of what's happening. Right? We all thought when Asher in India and Bekongo in Mali and Uezo in Eastern Africa, we thought when these household level citizen-led assessments uh, came in, that that was going to kind of shape the foundation for a little bit. Uh, not as much as anybody thought. So I, I wish I could stand here with you what you're asking. Helen. Thank you. Sorry. To begin with, I am very much um, appreciative uh, that uh, you are saying all of this stuff. <laughs> For all these years, I've been all alone in the World Bank battling everybody to keep so Everybody knows that I spent the last three and a half years. Incredible things. Eva needs to open her mouth because she did all of this uh, uh, assessment, the magnitude processing. Eva has a whole lot to say about a lot of this stuff. Uh, so she, you know, very modest. 
but <laughs> but uh, Linda, and these are comments, but I am very glad you're bringing up the, the, the cardinality principle. The one study that I have on this talks about attaining cardinality by age four. How many of these do we get? And of course, that's quote unquote the global north, but then that means that all of these children, I mean, the neuroscience means that they're stopped there like tables that sometimes that are due to nutrition and the stimulation that the tables are thicker, information travels for many seconds. And uh, yeah, some of these children don't have the stimulation that are having nutrition, as you said, so the tables are thin. But, you know, how much stimulation vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, nutrition, you know, it is the trade-off of this kind of stuff, iron and all of these other, where's the lady? Oh, that's because iron has to do with Somebody's stepping out of that. the day. Do we, you know, what percentage of the children are in the global south do we get to have cardinality at age four? Because from then on, with all of these automatic, automatic uh, functions come. The triple code, I would like very much for everyone here to discuss, to discuss concepts more in terms of the triple code. And whoever doesn't know, triple code means I see a number, say whatever the European numbers today are, I call it with the name of our language. Then let's say if it's a three, then I get the sense of trinity. And that needs to come out automatic automatically. The children have trouble um, completing the triple code. The magnitude processing is missing. What do we do about that? Again, some of it is in the as we know. It is useful. I found it useful to discuss math in this respect because we need a little bit to Singapore math. Yeah. Where you see the two pieces of the triple code and then you see the rest. So um, we're looking at the blackboard there about dot lines, which is fine. I wonder whether, you know, whether squares might make a difference. Interesting, because you see this. I would like, yeah, I would like oh, to say more about estimations. So much of that, no one talks about it. How do we get the teachers to estimations? Um, a huge issue everyone's talking about is automaticity. Mental math is what makes them students Linda says, you know, you group things and you separate them and you put them in parentheses and, you know, the numbers don't fly, you know, the magnitude is going to remain the same in your mind. Um, what does it take? You don't have very good sense, you know. The various neuroscientists that I often talk to, they describe something, you know, discover something. Here it is. Now, how do we get to it? Well, this one friend of mine says, that's not my job. You figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but we need to do it. We have the best teams in the world able to see if with 15 hours of God knows what, with 300 children, do we get uh, magnitude processing to where we get all of these? Or do we get cardinality by age five, by age six, whatever? First, need to become fluent and, you know, automatic calculation calculators, their mental calculators where they'll swap the children. Oh. I do have a study, yeah, some of these studies you do them, but, you know, that with a few hours, they could be, try that out. Um, that's the stuff, uh, for anybody who knows, my hobby has been for the last 21 years of collecting studies and putting them in plots. And then I open them up and see what we have. Um, two interesting uh, um, monitoring indicators. One is the cardinality, assuming H4 is a, magic number. How many of the first graders at the end of grade one get the cardinality principle? How do we measure? That's a uh, standard number. Another one, which exists from the 1990s, is the single digits of rated per minute. Correct me. Remember, Deepa and I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out what the hell we were talking about from the textbooks. Um, we can do that. And that has been used. And it should be in the EGBA, but it's not. Because again, these things appear when they appear. But single digits operated per minute, as you know, has high predictive validity and it is doable. So, thanks. Great. I'm going to go ahead and ask for closing thoughts from the panel. Um, we've obviously gone way over time, but I think it's just subject matter. So, that's me. Uh, <laughs> Your closing <laughs> observations? Um, yeah, maybe maybe I will go. Why don't you start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go this way. Um, 
I think, I mean, for me, just listening to all of us and then to, to listen to the questions, I, I feel like we have come up with a couple of areas that we all feel strongly about in terms of what might be important to address. And I think that rather than, you know, coming up with one approach or one way to do things, I really think we need to test out a variety of different approaches, things that Helen was just mentioning, that other people have done, and not kind of confine ourselves to say that this is the approach that would have the most success, because I don't think that there is one approach that would have the most success. So I think that we still need to do a little bit of work to test out and see uh, what does have um, success and, and then move forward there and maybe operationalize a couple of different ideas. Okay, um, I wanted to pick up uh, the, one of the, the first uh, points that you mentioned, which was how do we simplify this? Uh, uh, an incredibly rich body of research on how to learn slides? mathematics. Yeah. Um, that, that we do have an incredibly rich <clears throat> how children learn mathematics and that sort of thing. Um, the type of skills that they need to develop. Um, but we need to package it in a way that teachers who don't bring depth of understanding are going to be able to understand what is important. Um, so I do think that we are going to have to try to simplify this. But in simplifying it, we have to make sure that it is extremely solid and valid and that what we know about how children learn. I do think that's going to be a key. I am without compromising what we know. I don't have the answer. But. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I'll pick it from where you start. Now, there is this saying that uh, most things work in education, but of course there are things that work Right. <laughs> and sometimes that's what we look for. And we have so many models, there is knowledge, there are activities, and all this is adding up to your teacher and his or her learners. And so we want him or her to practice it this way because that will be shown to work. Shown to, to work better in this context. So we want him to teach, and every, each year we bring in new things. Same teacher. And we'll continue doing that for the next, until the teacher retires. <laughs> <laughs> and, and reflecting on that, one of the things that I think can make a difference is introducing the idea of the coach, the mentor. At my workplace, I have a coach, I have a mentor. But then you have the teacher out in the field for 20 years without that kind of so classroom-based support for the teachers, probably moving forward, will help us see how some of these models and, uh, and the kind of knowledge that we wanted the teacher to demonstrate in class, we're going to see uh, some changes. Um, I think I have two takeaways. One is that uh, we do need more research in uh, how children develop mathematically from low and middle income countries. Um, I did a study uh, last year and um, one of the things that we hold off on in the United States is numeral recognition. I think, ooh, don't push that in the early years, that's really a bad thing, they can't do that. But uh, actually, children seem to be able to do it just as well if they can do alphabet you know, recognition. And so, um, in, uh, so the study was in Tanzania and Laos um, and they did really well possibly better than we do here in the United States. So to make assumptions that, you know, the, the knowledge base that we have right now is complete, I think is erroneous. And I think that this, this goes even beyond, I mean, of course it goes beyond the, uh, what developmental progressions might look like in different settings. And the other is that we really need to pay attention to context. Um, so we may have identified these practices in, in 24 studies that are kind of across world and low and uh, middle income countries, um, but it's very difficult to take one of those practices and then translate it into another one effectively unless you're really in that uh, context. And so I think that being, uh, making sure that we work with individuals who are in those contexts.
and make sure that they work and change them however. Um, and also to look at, sorry, that makes three. That's three. Um, <laughs> cardinality. Good cardinality. Three. Yeah, good cardinality. Um, yeah. um, is to uh, look at the teacher practices. So do more research, not just on child outcomes, but how are we getting those child outcomes? What are we doing in those classrooms? Or um, what more of what Moses flew here from Penny and right. about. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and then, so three was three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, So I think everyone said um, very good things, which I kept writing down things and then crossing them out because that's what <laughs> someone just said that. So I think we're all kind of on the same page. I think just going a little bit further with the contextualization and thinking about um, what practices look like in particular contexts, but also, you know, one of the areas we haven't done that much research on, I know they're doing a little bit, we're doing a little bit with RTI, is understanding why teachers are teaching the way that they are and trying to make sure our practices are fitting with what they're already doing. Um, I think you're going into a context and saying, everyone should be okay with having the students argue with each other in mathematics. That's very uncomfortable for in a lot of contexts, and you don't want students don't want to argue with the teacher, and they don't do it. And we go in and tell them, and then we say, "Why did this fail? <laughs> you know, this didn't work." And so yeah. I think if we can do a little bit more, kind of pre-research to see what does the teaching look like in the context we're working at, and why are they doing it that way, and how can we fit maybe a few new practices into that model instead of saying, here's a new model, do it. Yes. Right? So I think yes, yes. the more we can do that kind of stuff, that would be, I think, we'll have more success in the long run. I want to thank everyone, and apologies to Deepa that you didn't get to talk. Yes, <laughs> <laughs>